right, let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 18 this morning. Genesis chapter 18. And we continue studying and observing the life of Abraham. A life that we have come to realize is an all-in life. A life that wherever God says go, he goes. Whatever God says do, he does. And he doesn't do it perfectly. And he doesn't do it altogether rightly at times. And yet he seemingly, by the grace of God, is able to accomplish the promises and plans that God had for his life. And, and God's called us to that same life. But let's, let's just be real honest. As we approach any character in the scriptures, as we seek to understand the Bible, when we read about God's um, experience, or let me rephrase that, Abraham's experience with God, we can never in the 21st century make a one-to-one -one correlation between Abraham and ourselves. Let's be honest. Abraham is his own man, experiencing his own life, living in his own culture, living in his own time, living in his own place. And for many of us, we can't get there. Uh, we can't go back and rewind time to be a part of that season in those moments. And so as we read the life of Abraham, as we see him experience God in his own real and personal way, what we are called to do as students of the word is to glean whatever truth truths that transcend the culture, transcend the time, transcend the personal experience that we can take and apply to our lives. And it doesn't fit one-to-one, -one, but what we can do is see what an all-in life looks like, how Abraham modeled that all-in life for us. Now, we've seen some of those truths, that an all-in life means that we are to follow God, that we are to prioritize God, that we are to trust God even when it doesn't make sense. And this morning, we're going to learn from our text what it means to serve God, not only in our relationship to him, but in our relationship with one another. Now, when we talk about serving God, we usually think that it's just utilitarian, that there's a need that the church has. I need, the church uh, gives an announcement. We need people to do this or that. And we fill the role because we feel guilty or we know that the church has a need and we want to accomplish it. And that's what serving God is all about. But this morning, I want you to see that that is not serving God according to Abraham. Because Abraham shows us what serving God is all about. It isn't simply just filling a spot when ministry takes place. In fact, what we learn is, is that to serve God is to do the very thing that God has called all of his followers to do. In fact, one of the great tragedies of the Christian life is a Christian who, see, who, who ceases to serve God in faith-stretching ways. God has called all of us to do that. And we see that in Luke 10, 27, when Jesus says that the chief goal of man, the chief purpose of his followers is to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And for many of us, we get that element of serving God. We love God and we seek to honor him by worshiping and praising him and, and reading his word and growing in our relationship with God. But we forget the second part of that verse, that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. You see, serving God has a vertical component to it, but a horizontal one that impacts not only the lives of those closest to us, but also the lives of the world and the people around us. Now, serving God has to begin first with that vertical relationship. And what we need to do as followers of Jesus Christ is to experience God, to experience him in our own way, and to experience him not in a mediocre way, not in a uh, half-filled kind of way, but in an overflowing way. To have such an incredible walk with God that it compels us, literally it propels us not to stay where we're at, but to go and to share that with others. To put it another way, as God fills up your cup to overflowing, serving is taking your cup and start to fill cups around you with the overflow of God's grace and his goodness and his love and his mercy and his goodness that he has shown to you that we are called to show others. 
Now, God has shared this with Abraham. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pour into your cup to overflowing. And your job is through my blessing to be a blessing to all others. Serving is to take God's blessings and to be a funnel of God's blessings to other people. Now, I looked and tried to figure out a way to best illustrate this, and I was going through my Twitter feed this last weekend, just looking at different things that had come up, and a video had gone viral that when I saw it, I said, that is a picture of serving God. Now, before I show it, it involves a kid playing the part of Dracula, and it's him trick-or-treating. Maybe some of you saw this, but in it is a picture of what it means for us to serve God. Let's take a look at the screen. Aww, that was really nice, Jackson. Okay. 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 We're next kids. There you go! Danielle's like, no, I want that one. <laughs> oh, that's right. See, your pastor has a, a nice part in, a part in his heart for little kids, right? What do we see there? We see a kid coming upon something that is empty. Now, right away... A selfish individual would say, how dare these people not have candy for me when I get there, right? This kid does the opposite. He sees that which is empty, that which is lacking something, and he recognizes something. He says, you know, all the other houses have been so generous with me, I can take out of the generosity of what they've given me, and I can take it and put it into something that has nothing. Listen to me very, very carefully. Being a Christian and serving God is taking the benefits and blessing of God and going to a world of people who are empty and taking out of the generosity of what God has given us and start putting it into the lives of other people. Do you understand that? It is taking what God has given us and utilizing it. Now, this is happening all over the place. It's happening right now. I have taken a week of my study, a week of the overflow of God's goodness to your pastor, and the excitement I have about what I've learned in God's word, and I have, by your grace, been given the opportunity to take what I feel I'm overflowing with and to pour it into your lives. It's happening as people greet you. That as they have the joy of the Lord in their life, they stick out their hand and say, good morning, it's great to have you. Hopefully some of that joy is filling up into your cup. That's happening right now, and it did in the first service. As kids run out of this place saying, thank you, we don't have to listen to Pastor Tim. Run, run like the wind. And they go into their classrooms, and they sit with teachers who are excited about the love that God has shown them. And they say, let me tell you about how God has moved in my life. Let me tell you about God's grace in my life. We're seeing that right now. 170 of our students are at uh, fall retreat. And let's pray for them as they make their travels back from Michigan. But then when we're done praying for them, let's pray three times as much for those leaders who have endured now 72 hours of all kinds of bad smells and awkward talks and all of that, right? And these people took away their weekend. I remind my boys of this. These leaders volunteer their time. Who in their right mind would give up their weekend to be with children, teenagers, people that love the Lord, people who are overflowing with the grace and mercy and love and joy of God. And what do they want to do? They want to take it after a hard work week and they want to pour it into the lives of our kids. Man, we should have awards for these people because that's what serving God looks like. You've seen it with the worship team. 
You saw it with Elder John here with communion. We don't have to be up here because we have to. We're not doing this for a begrud- because we're begrudging in it. We're doing it because we have experienced God. And so what does serving God look like? It is us taking what God has done in our life and taking it to the world. That's what we're gonna see in Genesis 18 this morning. Now to catch us up, because we have limited time this morning, let me catch you up with where we're going to go eventually in the weeks to come. We're gonna start in Genesis 18, starting in verse 16. But there's a ton that happens in Genesis 18, one through 16. And in that passage, Abraham and Sarah are living life in Canaan, living in a tent, and one random day, three visitors come to their tent, unannounced. Now, these guys are mysterious. Three of them are, uh, these, these are unlike any visitors they've ever had. And Abraham deduces very quickly that these men are, are heavenly creatures. In fact, he calls one of them, my Lord. And, and the Bible translators tell us that this, my Lord, is someone significant, and we capitalize that phrase, Lord, which tells us that Jesus Christ, in his pre-incarnate a place, visited Abraham and Sarah in their tents. Jesus is making what is called a theophany, a pre-incarnate appearance prior to Bethlehem. And he comes and he visits and we learn later on that two angels are with him. And they come and they visit and Abraham and Sarah are running around fixing food. Just think about Jesus and two angels coming to your house and how much you would be busy trying to give them the best of everything you have. And and when time is finished with dinner, Abraham and these three men are talking and the Lord says, when we come back... uh, in a year, your promised son will be here. You're going to see the fulfillment of the promise that God made to you in Genesis chapter 12. You're going to have the boy you've been waiting for. Now, and we'll talk about this later, Sarah is not in the tent at the time. She's outside of the tent, but here's what's going on, and she laughs. You've got to be kidding me. I'm old. Have you seen my husband? He's even older it ain't gonna happen. And we're gonna see God uses that in some awesome ways. So we'll be talking about that episode in the days to come. Now, what happens is after dinner, these men head out. And they, we know where they're going. We are told they're going towards Sodom. That is the city, if you remember, where Lot chooses to find his inhabitants. And so he goes and he is living in Sodom. And we know Sodom is a place of great debauchery and sin. And they're heading out. And the reason why they're heading out there is they've heard up to heaven the great outcry against these cities. That is, is there's murmuring, there's, there's pangs of pain and sorrow that have made their way up. And what a reminder for us that when we suffer, when we experience pain on earth, heaven hears it. And Jesus sends his angels to look into it and he has made a decision that he is gonna destroy the city. And what we're going to see is Abraham, for the first time in all of Scripture, one human being is going to intercede for another human being or human beings with God. He's going to intercede. He's going to go on behalf of or go before a group of people and seek to serve them while serving his God. Now we're gonna learn three truths that I'm gonna move through quickly this morning. Three truths that we need to remember. If we're gonna serve God, if we're gonna serve God, then it begins, number one, write this down, it begins with us seeing God at work. Seeing God at work. We can't serve God without knowing where he's at work. Henry Blackaby was an author and pastor of a book that he wrote that revolutionized the church world called Experiencing God. And one of the main truths that he came out with in this book was God is on the move. He's working. What you've got to do is you've got to find where he's working and meet him there. 
Don't try to start some new work. God's already at work. God is the, the one who begins all the work that he is going to do. We got to go find where that's at. Well, how was Abraham going to know what God was doing? Notice what we see. First of all, seeing God at work begins by walking with God. Notice in the text, verse 16. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to send them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So the Lord may bring to Abraham what has been promised to him. Then the Lord said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave. I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. What God has just done is he's unveiled his plans and purposes to Abraham. Now, how does Abraham get in tune with that? He does something that we can do. And that is walk with God. Notice it says, as they're heading off to Sodom, Abraham continues with them. Have you ever had a guest in your house that you did not want to see go? You were watching the time go away from you and you're like, I wish they could stay. I wish we could extend this time. This is what Abraham had. He had experienced a great time with these three heavenly beings. And he doesn't want that time to go away. And so what does he tell Sarah? He says, hey, Sarah, I'm going to walk with them for a while. I'm going to extend our time. I'm going to see them on their way. And I'm going to make sure I get whatever opportunity I have to, if you will, get all the meat off the bone. I want all of it. And as he does, he positions himself in an opportunity to hear from God. Had Abraham said, you know, I've had enough of God. We had a nice little visit. See you later, God. Just go on your way. He would have never heard it. But because he desired more time with God and, and a consistent and, and, and elongated time with God, he was able to hear what God was planning to do. Now, you and I don't have the great opportunity as Abraham did to go on a walk with God. You can't call up to heaven and say, hey, God, I'm down here at 410 Prairie View Lane. I'd like to go on a walk around my neighborhood. Come with me. He doesn't do that. But the Bible says that walking with God is a reality for all believers. To walk with God, the Bible says, refers to our life or a lifestyle. In the New Testament, we are told that this is walking according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. What it means is, I am so in tune with what God is doing with my life that literally, it's as if we, him and I are walking as two individuals walk a path together. That he leads and wherever he goes, I go. Wherever, whatever he does, I do. So my thoughts and my decisions and my plans and my priorities are all in tune with this God who I'm walking with. Now, to walk with God means that Abraham had to say no to things on his schedule. He had to say no to things that might have been important to him so that he could be without distraction walking with God. And so it is for every one of us. We can never think we're going to know the plans and purposes of God unless we are walking with him. We've got to walk with him. But notice it goes beyond walking. It involves talking with him. Along the journey, as they're heading towards Sodom, God gives an opportunity to get a sneak peek to Abraham. And notice something important. Abraham doesn't say, where are you guys going? What are you guys doing? God is the one who reveals himself. And he says, this is what we're going to do. So what Abraham has done is he has positioned himself in a place, in a posture that God, if God is willing to reveal himself, he's ready to receive it. And so they begin to talk. And should we tell Abraham these things? And, and so what does he begin to tell him? He says, listen, Abraham, the outcry, verse 20, against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave. I'm going to go down there. 
and I'm going to judge the city. And what Abraham hears, he doesn't like. He doesn't like what he hears. Notice in verse 22. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom. The two angels go towards Sodom. But Abraham stood there before the Lord. Verse 23. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the rich, righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham goes on and he answers, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I who am just but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous there. Again, Abraham spoke and said, suppose 40 are found there. And God answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. And when I speak... Suppose 30 are found there. And God answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And Abraham said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose that 20 are found there. And God answered, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak again, but this one, suppose 10 are found there. And the Lord answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went on his way. And when he had finished speaking to Abraham, when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Let's stop there. A conversation happens. Now, we talked about our conversations with God last week. Remember, we're to speak honestly. We see that in the text. Remember, we're to speak humbly. And we see that in the text over and over again. Don't be mad at me, God. I am but ashes and dust. I recognize my place, and who am I to speak? But I have come to see you as a friend. I've come to see you as one that I can speak to as a man speaks to a man. I, I, I believe you are a good and righteous judge. I know who you are. And what I'm hearing doesn't seem to work with what I'm seeing you about to do. And what it is, is what Abraham has is this thought that there's a bunch of righteous people in Sodom, and because of that, surely God wouldn't kill the righteous or judge the righteous for the deeds of the unrighteous. And so he begins to bargain with God, and he starts with 50. And what scholars believe he's doing is he knows that Lot, his nephew, lives in Sodom. Now, Lot wasn't the only one who lived with Abraham when they were together in Canaan, but it was Lot and his entire household. And there was a populous group of individuals in Lot's household, so much that they had to separate, remember? And so Abraham no doubt is thinking there surely has to be some righteous people in Lot's household. He had lots of people that lived under our care. He saw God's blessing in my life, and we talked about what God had promised. Surely... There's got to be 50 of them, and then it goes down to 45, and 40, 30, 20, and 10. And he's beginning to recognize and know that Sodom is a way more wicked place than maybe he even had come to realize. And he knew it. Abraham had no allegiances to Sodom. He knew it was a wicked place. We see that earlier in the storyline. And he talks with God about it. How often do you talk with God about the condition of the people around you? How often do you intercede on their behalf? How often do you wrestle with God about your neighbors? About that person in the cubicle next to you? About that kid that shares the desk and class with you? How often are we wrestling with God over their eternal destiny? God, show them mercy. God, show them grace. God, give them an opportunity. God, be patient so that they might experience a righteousness that only comes from you. It begins by walking and talking with God.
What you're seeing in the text, even though there's not the word there that we think of, what we're seeing is prayer. Prayer. Man talking to God. That's the quintessential definition of prayer. Us communicating with the God of the universe. And notice, he does it confidently, he does it honestly, he does it humbly, and he does it in a real way. And he does it persistently. Going back to God, getting to God, what is the heart of it? And God saying, listen, if you can find some righteous people, no, I will not destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. And so Abraham's on a journey to figure out how can I find 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom? And what he does is he takes them to God in prayer. How persistent are we with our prayers for others? Now Abraham could have stopped there. And he could have seen God at work and headed back home and gotten to the tent to Sarah and said, hey Sarah, I talked with the Lord. And the Lord's going to destroy Sodom. So no more going to the Sodom Aldi. Stay away from Sodom. We're not going to any of the Sodom football games. We're not going to go visit our friends in Sodom. Stay away. Lot, we're not doing Thanksgiving in Sodom. God's going to destroy the city. So save yourself. That's not what Abraham does. And that's not why God tells Abraham that Sodom is going to be destroyed. Notice that serving God isn't just seeing God at work, but notice it is us showing God to others. Showing God to others. Notice in the text, Abraham has this awesome experience with God. And he's experiencing God. And that experience doesn't stay with him. Nor does God intend for it to stay with him. Notice in the text, he says in verse 16, I'm sorry, verse 17, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him to do what? that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised. God shares with Abraham what he's going to do in Sodom, first of all, so that Abraham might prepare those closest to him. Write that down. We are to show God and what he's doing to those that are closest to us, our family, our household, the scripture says. And so what he was supposed to do was he was to communicate what he had experienced in God to his family. Why? So that what God was going to do to the unrighteous would never happen to Abraham's family because they have been raised in righteousness and justice. Listen to me, my friends, who are parents and grandparents in this place. One of the biggest reasons why you need to be vigilant in your walk with God is so that you may show that God you're experiencing to your children and to your spouse and to your extended family and to your grandchildren so that they will not fall under the same Uh, ending as Sodom and Gomorrah did, but that they may thrive and be vibrant and experience the righteousness and justice of God before it's too late. And so let me ask you this morning, how strong, how full is your relationship with the God of the universe? Is it so big that it impacts your family? Would your children, parents, say, boy, my mom, my dad have an awesome relationship with God? Well, how do you know that? Because that's all they talk about with me. Let me give you a, a point of reference. Yesterday, my, my wife, Amanda, and I stopped at my parents' house. And it was just a, a, just a quick visit. We weren't sharing a meal or anything. And, and my dad, 70 years old, my dad comes in, Tim, Amanda, sit down, sit down. 
What, Dad? We, we gotta go. You know, we've got, we've got no kids with us. Leave us alone, okay? No, you sit. Why? I gotta tell you what the Lord's been sharing with me. I'm so excited. God calls us, Tim, Amanda, are you listening? God calls us to be people of prayer. God calls us to be people of obedience. God calls us, and I'm like, Dad, it's not even Sunday and you're preaching. 70 years old, when a walk with God should be stale and commonplace. My dad, like it's Christmas morning and he's nine years old, is excited. And what does he say? I can't hold this in my own life, so I'm going to pour it into those who mean the most to me. Listen, our relationship with God should have a direct correlation to our relationship with our children. And so, yes, our children will experience great things with their leaders this week. But never let the leaders of the youth group be the only spiritual giants in your kids' lives. You and I, as parents, are the number one disciplers. We are called, as Abraham was, to pour into the life of our households. But it goes beyond that, number two, to the communities around us. To the communities around us. Now listen, Abraham from all that we know, does very little with Sodom and Gomorrah. He keeps a healthy distance from their activity and their debauchery and their vices and sin. But he has a heart for them. He doesn't want to see God destroy the city. In fact, he believes that there's enough righteous people there that God would altogether spare the city. And he goes on behalf of God and he says, God, I love Sodom. Surely you don't need to destroy Sodom because there's enough people there that love you and and honor you. Let me go find them for you so that you might see them. And at the heart of it, what it is is that Abraham loved that community that he was willing to go to God on its behalf. Jeremiah would tell us this when he speaks to a group of exiles in Babylon and he tells the Israelites of his day, seek the welfare of the city. And so what that means for us as a church is we should be the biggest proponents to God for the community of Sugar Grove. We should want to see God do big and and awesome things in the community of Sugar Grove. And we should be showing that, and people of the Sugar Grove should see that, that if ever, God forbid, that we were to ever not have this place and do ministry in this place, that Sugar Grove would hold up their hands and go, what are we going to do now that Village Bible Church is no longer here? They served us. They honored us. They they went before their God and, and petitioned for our good. They sought the welfare of the city of Sugar Grove. And we are a better community because they're in our midst. And that's true on an individual basis wherever you live. Your neighbor should be one of the most prayed for people. In all of humanity. Why? Because according to God's sovereignty, he placed you right next to them. And they should be the most prayed for people. They should be the most loved people. They should be the most inner, I- I- integrated people into your life. But you say, but wait a minute. They're sinners. They drink beer. They watch bad movies. They do all of this bad stuff. Listen, Sodom was a bad place and it did not keep Abraham from loving them and bringing them before God. And he petitions for them and he prays for them and he loves them and he goes to bat for them because he loved his community. Serving God means showing God to others. It starts in our home and then our communities. But he goes even farther and he stands in the gap for them. And I'm going to close. We don't got much time left, so let's just kind of bring this to an end. He stands in the gap for him. And he says, Lord, I'll go find you, these people. Now go on this journey. We'll go and find them. I want you to understand something that Abraham understood that's true for us in the 21st century. Your approach to your community, that is your workplace, your school, your neighbors, 
will fall under one of four categories. Write these down. Number one, you will buy into the idea of fortification. Fortification is as a Christian, you build walls around you so that non-believers cannot dirty you. So build walls, big, beautiful walls. That was a joke. <laughs> Fortification. And some of you are building walls around the unbelievers around you, and it's doing it out of protection. Then some of us are like, no, no, we've got to be in the world. And you've bought into accommodation. Lot has bought into accommodation. He's bought into the city. He's married a woman within the city. He's become a leading member of the city. He is altogether accommodating the culture and made it a part of his. It's accommodation. And some of you right now, you're like, no, fortification is not the way to do it. It's accommodation, and that's wrong. There are still others, and boy, this is alive and well in our nation today. It's domination. We'll take this country, we'll take this community back for ourselves. And we'll make it a Christian nation. We'll bring it back to the good old days. The city of Sugar Grove, whether they like it or not, is going to play by villages' rules, not their own. Domination. None of these work. None of these are prescribed in Scripture. What the Bible talks about, it uses two phrases, salt and light. And those two things are all about permeation engaging and starting small and praying by the grace and mercy of God that our impact, our influence will have a greater impact than what it is, isn't forcing people or doing what people do, but being the light in the world of darkness, being the salt in the, the world that needs that preservation to change the world. So how do we live lives of permeation? How did Abraham do it? Notice three things and I'll close. Number one, it involves caring for all people. Do you know what kind of people lived in Sodom? Dirty, filthy people. But Abraham still cared. And we need to care. We need to stop labeling people. And we need to start caring for them. Is there a place that we don't act as they do? Yes. Is there a place where we speak truth against air? Yes. But never let that trump our love and care for them as human beings. For them as people who are lost just as we were lost and without hope. We have to care. Pray. This is your number one prayer leaving this place. God, give me the heart for my neighbor, the heart for my community, the heart for my workplace, the heart for my school that you have for it. Show me where you're at work in those places and let me meet you there. Number two, it means being convinced that judgment is coming. Why does Abraham do it? Why does Abraham go, no, God, you can't do this? Because he knows when God says judgment's coming, it's coming. And likewise, we know that to be true. We know that judgment is coming. Jesus Christ will come back and bring judgment to the world. That every name that's not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. That is our neighbor. That is our coworker. That is our friend. That may be your spouse. They are going to spend eternity in hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Apart from any good or any grace of God, that is their eternity. And it's in this book, and we believe this book, and we're convinced of this book, and yet we go about life, and I do the same thing, as if we've got all the time in the world. People are lost, and judgment is coming. Do we care enough about them to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them? And finally, do we believe we can accomplish great good and great change? Now, from an earthly standpoint, in Genesis 19, we will see at my heading at the top of verse 23 says, God destroys Sodom. Abraham failed. And we think, well, so am I. I'm failing too. I'm trying. I'm seeking to honor God. I'm seeking to make a change. And, and the world's going bad. And God is going to destroy this world one of these days. 
But in verse 29, just look and we'll close. It tells us something that gives you and I hope to serve God. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, that is Sodom and Gomorrah, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of its midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. Did Abraham find 50? No. 45? No. 40? No. 30? No. 20? No. 10? No. But we are told that righteous, that, that Lot was a righteous man in the book of Jude and the book of 2 Peter. And God remembered before he destroyed the city, God rescued Lot and his family. And three of them were saved. Could it be that God will use you as you serve him to rescue from the impending destruction even one? Surely it's worth our time. Surely it's worth our effort to save a soul from the flames of hell. Abraham was all in and serving God, and you know what it did? It blessed others. Abraham is starting to understand that as God blesses him, it is our great opportunity to be a blessing to others. So, let's close with this. God has blessed us in immeasurable ways. Will we take that blessing and keep it for ourselves, Or will we be generous and give our time and our talents and our treasure to others so they may experience the goodness and grace we've experienced. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, as we close out our time this morning, I thank you for all that you've taught us. You've taught us truths of your word and who you are through song. We have been reminded of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ as we have partaken of two very basic elements of bread and juice. And in it, Lord, we have been reminded of the great sacrifice that you who was rich became poor on our behalf. You interceded for us, knowing that the Father was bringing judgment. You did what Abraham did for the people of Sodom for us. And now, Lord, we have the calling to leave this place and to serve you by serving others. Give us the capacity to love. Give us the capacity to see. Give us the capacity to know that those people we're living life with are on the road to hell and they need to be saved. And you have purposed that it is our feet and our hands and our mouth that brings that message that will save many. Lord, we know that you would use Abraham to save three. And Lord, might you use us, might you use this church to save many from the clutches of destruction and hell. Give us the power. Give us the passion. And give us the eyes to see where you're at work so that we may serve you and serve others in this world. We love you and we thank you for modeling that and giving us Abraham who modeled it in a very human way for us so that we may follow that modeling and serve you with all our hearts. Now, Lord, send us forth from this place in peace and in fellowship with one another. We give you the praise for it all. In Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, amen.